Why should we test the spirits? Because God commands us to. Not complicated. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. What? You mean some of them may not be? That's kind of a scary and disturbing thought to a lot of people. I mean, here the Apostle John has been saying in 1 John 4, 1 and following, and in 1 John 2, all through 1 John, we have an anointing from the Holy One, 1 John 2, 20. You have no need of anyone to teach you, 1 John 2, 24. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit which he gives us, 1 John 3, 24. And oh, by the way, you better test the spirits to see whether they're from God because you may wind up with one that isn't. Test the spirits is God's command. And you better be alert and beware and be very wary and careful of anyone who tells you you don't need to. John Arnott, who was the head pastor of Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, in a tape, 12 16, 1994, said, quote, Don't even entertain the thought that you might get a counterfeit. We need to have more faith in God's ability to bless than Satan's ability to deceive. You, any of you ever hear that? Our God is bigger than your big bad old devil. John Wimber actually said that to me. We, my husband and I were part of the vineyard from the day that John Wimber actually joined up with it when... when the pastor of the vineyard actually came back from South Africa with him. And John opened up the door to do the stuff, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles, which, by the way, I believe are valid for today. I am not a cessationist. I no longer call myself a charismatic because the term, frankly, and I think tonight and uh, during this past weekend, you've had a glimpse of why, the term freaks me out. I'm a continuationist. I believe the Holy Spirit did not croak, if you will, at the end of the first century. He hasn't been on a 1900-year sabbatical. But you better test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And those commands to test the spirits are given in the context of the exercise of the genuine, right? John Wimber said, oh, we don't need to teach the young prophets how to test the spirits. Our God is big enough to sort it all out. They'll figure it out as we go along. Lou Giglio in a conference that, that Carol Matriciana showed a few years ago at another conference we were doing together, a Calvary Chapel up north in Gold Country, a conference that took place in January 2011, probably in Texas, we think, with Beth Moore, with John Piper, where they were leading the people into a Lectio Divina exercise. And Lou Giglio steps up afterwards and he says, don't you for one split second let anybody put a doubt in your mind that God, that that voice you're hearing in your head is from God. You are worthy of God speaking to you. In other words, what they were saying is your sincerity acts as kind of a magical blanket of protection. But nowhere in the Bible is there a single verse that assures us that our ignorance or our sincerity alone will protect us or guarantee us automatic immunity from demonic deception, not one. I defy you to show me one. On the contrary, John 3, 7, little children, let no one deceive you. 2 John 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 3, in the last days, dangerous times will come. Evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God that you may stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And the tragedy in the church today, one of many, is that the, the average Christian wouldn't know a scheme if it ran us over in the street. Is it any wonder that most of us sheep in God's pasture in the average church look more like a steaming plate of lovely lamb chops? Because we haven't got a clue what the schemes of the devil look. We're standing firm against the schemes of the devil. And we haven't got a clue what they are. Deception is one of his biggest ones. If you need any greater authority, Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, verse 4, see to it no one mislead you. Many false Christs will arise in my name and will mislead many. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise, will mislead many. Verse 23, 24, 25, for false prophets and false Christs will arise showing great signs and wonders and will mislead where it possible and clearly it is or the Holy Spirit wouldn't have wasted so much paper and parchment warning us about not being deceived even the elect. The key sign of the end of the age is massive spiritual deception. You've heard it time and time again from virtually every speaker this weekend. 
Christian occultists with genuine power is what Jesus was talking about. Rick Warren and the Preterists notwithstanding, Rick Warren who says to us prophecy is none of our business, and those who believe all a prophecy has been fulfilled as of 70 AD, we must know the times in which we live. Luke 12, 56, how is it you don't discern the time? And it's almost upon us. You've been hearing it all weekend. A one world government, a one world ruler, a one world religion of panentheistic unity and peace, bound together by an ecumenical universalist into spiritual philosophy that doesn't see division between anybody, and all glued together with experience, mysticism, altered state of consciousness. As, as Ray Youngen pointed out with Carl Rainer, the, the Roman Catholic mystic, where he says the Christian of the future will be a mystic, someone who has experienced something or he will be nothing at all. And all, of course, in the name of tolerance, the political correctness of our day, we offer our service, ourselves, our lives to the God we know by so many names. God, don't you know, it doesn't care whether you call him he, she, it, Allah, Om, uh, what, take your pick, Gaia, he doesn't care. Jim Wallace of Sojourners, a hardcore socialist. Some have dared to venture the term communist in reference to him. He's the spiritual advisor to President Obama. Actually said that it's time to put aside dogmas. All these narrow-minded Bible thumping fundamentalists with their doctrines, how very annoying. We need to put all that aside and have a one world unity. How many of you noticed any religion is hunky-dory, super terrific, unless you're a Bible-believing Christian. Alice Bailey, who was also mentioned by, by Ray, the occult prophetess who coined the term New Age, informed by her spirit guides that the New Age illumination would come through the Christian church, not around it. She instructed her followers to leave the outer shell of Christianity intact for the time being and change it from the inside. You don't need to eliminate all these Christians. Don't you know they'll be all up in arms about that? You infiltrate. You get yourself voted in. You get yourself ordained as pastor or pastorette. And you change the theology, bringing in Sophia, Mother Goddess, a, a, a kinder, gentler Jesus, without all this blood dripping from the cross or hell, as Brian McLaren said. It's the worst advertising God ever had. Who needs that? Second, no kidding. Purple iPod, uh, Purple Podcast uh, in uh, 2005 in an interview with Leif Hansen. Hell is the worst advertising God ever had. What kind of God is going to decree eternal separation from himself in hell for a finite amount of sin? Oh, I wish we had the time to talk about what some of these people are teaching you. Very persuasive, reasonable, inclusive, loving, and totally ignoring the fact that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Again, let me tell you, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter times we're in them. Some, he meant many, shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines taught by demons. God's word commands us to test the spirits. Thessal, 1 Thessal, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 21. Despise not prophetic utterances, quench not the spirit. Amen? But test all things carefully, hold fast to that which is good, which by implication means you do something radical with that which isn't. How do you test the spirits? Well, you've got the occult version. Even the occultists will tell you important to test the spirits. Yes, it is. Let me give you one test that the occultist, Silva Mind Control, which I was involved with, as you know from my testimony last night. In many ways, says Silva Mind Control, it doesn't matter what the source of good, uplifting information is, as long as it's valid. How do you know if a spirit or something communicating to you is good? Well, if it's valid, if it feels good, then you know it has to be important and good and valid. They won't say from God, because that's not quite where they are with that. The information, energy, wisdom, or guidance is either good, meaning it works, or it's not meaning it doesn't work. 
This must be the final test of any channel or any channeled being and of all channeled information. So how do you know if a being that comes and says he's Hermanito Cuauhtémoc or Jesus? I attended numerous uh, sessions with Pachita, the medium with whom I worked in Mexico City, the shaman psychic surgeon, in which Jesus himself came and gave us teachings. The Jesus in my psychic laboratory who gave me much wisdom and many teachings. How do you know? Oh, well, it's valid enough. It makes you feel good. Tired of the program? Change your channel. Isn't that a cute thing? You don't like what the channel, the medium is saying to you? Well, just show, trade it in for another one. Channeled material is of value only if it returns you to the grandeur of self. Look, the occultists and the, the heretics may have their own version of how you test the spirits. The scriptures give us their tests, and that's what I want us to look at. It's going to be a Reader's Digest version, condensed, like that. These are not the only tests, but from scripture, I believe they're the most important ones. The first test, and make a note of it, and I hope you have your Bibles on hand. If you don't have time to turn all the passages, write them down and look at them later, okay? Because we're going to be going like Speedy Gonzalez. Arriba, arriba, epale, epale, andale, andale. And we're going to move right through these, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. And this time the pastor will yank the lectern out from under me, and that will be disconcerting. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Open it with me. This one you do need to look at. It's important that you see this. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Enter through that narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, evangelical, dogmatic, and may I add, politically incorrect gate. What? You got a different translation? For the gate is wide and the way is broad, open-minded, inclusive, universalist, interspiritual, that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Oh, all this Jesus stuff? My goodness, how narrow-minded and bigoted can you get? How narrow-minded, you need to be more open-minded. Some of us are so open-minded, all our brains fell out. The scriptures don't give us that option. You've got a problem with narrow-minded, Bible-thumping Christians? Take it up with scripture. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you think for one split second, if there were another way to come to the Father, that Jesus would have been stupid enough to think he had to incarnate and leave the fellowship with the Trinity among themselves and come down to earth and go through everything he went through to die on a cross for this? If there had been any other way, what is the theology? And let me tell you now, let's continue in Matthew chapter 7. Few are those who find it. Verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The, the sheep's clothing, they pretend to be shepherds, teachers, overseers of the flock. Those were the ones who dressed in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, people, by what they're teaching you, by what they believe, by what they're disseminating, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by the fruits. And I will promise you, every occultist, every New Ager, every apostate, every heretic knows this passage. And then he gives you a little lesson in spiritual agriculture. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles. Good fruit doesn't come from bad trees. Bad trees don't produce good fruit. Therefore, you'll know them by their fruits. And I will tell you how many of you, I know I sure have, have heard people like Kenneth Copeland with the late Paul Crouch sitting there on the set of TBN. Well, this Dave Hunt, how dare he come across against God's anointed? Does he fly a Learjet? I do. Does he have a huge bank account? I do. Does he have books that sell in the mega billions? I do. The arrogance of these men who believe that good fruit means fame and even genuine spiritual power. William Branham, the patron saint, if you will, of New Apostolic Reformation, has had genuine psychic power. That man was the real thing as far as spiritual ability. The question is, what was it coming from? Was that good fruit? So then you will know them by their fruits. Now, let's read the rest of the passage because let me tell you something. There are several kinds of fruit here and I'm going to put it in context. Verse 21, you know that old time TV guy or was he a radio guy? And now for the rest of the story. What was his name? How, what was his name? Palmer. 
the rest of the, so then you will know them by their fruits. We'll look at all the cool stuff and all the people who come. And I've got a church with 10,000 people just on the other side of, of town. Obviously, that's good fruit and God's blessing. I mean, you little podunk piddly people with your tiny, obviously that can't be good fruit. Really? Really? Is that the measure that the Lord puts on it? I don't think so. Be careful of viewing things from the human perspective. So then you will know them by their fruits. Verse 20 of Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them the most horrendous, the most heart-wrenching, the most devastating words to be uttered in the universe. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now let's put this together with the fruits. There are two kinds of fruits. You've got the fruit of life. You remember the, the, the Galatians 5, the deeds of the flesh? False prophets are often characterized by adultery and falsehood. Jeremiah 23. And make note of these passages. We do not have time to look at them, but you need to examine these on your own. The characteristics of a false prophet. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3, verse 14, verse 19. Greed, lust, arrogance, deceit. They don't keep God's commands. 1 John 2, 4. They profess to know God, but by their deeds deny him. They've crept in ungodly and unnoticed. Jude 4 and Titus 1, 16. I will tell you that sets of Christian television is littered with the shipwrecked lives of false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, and false evangelists who stand up and preach the word while they're having an affair with the secretary and then dump the wife of 15, 20 years along with who knows how many babies because, oh, God led them, really? False prophets frequently are seen by the quality of their lives, but not always. Some false prophets and some of the most dangerous ones live exemplary lives. Pachita, the woman with whom I worked, would have put most Christians to open shame. I never saw this woman turn away anybody, even when she was old and sick and exhausted beyond words, selling her little trinkets on the street because she wouldn't collect money. Some of her followers did, but she wouldn't. People like, like Mother Teresa, who's going to falter on the surface looking at her life? Horrendous theology helping the Buddhist die a good Buddhist, helping the Muslim die a good Muslim, and thinking that if her nuns simply went like that with, with cool water on their forehead and said some magic words, that would be enough to get them into heaven, or at least purgatory. But on the surface, these false teachers, these false prophets lived exemplary lives. Mark Galley, are you guys familiar with Mark Galley? He's the, the editor of uh, Christianity Today and uh, was the editor of Christian History magazine. He said in a recent article that came out uh, in 2013, Incredible Journeys, What to Make of Visits of Heaven, as he was examining these disparate stories of people who supposedly have these near-death experiences and come back saying, well, I met God, his name is Om. Well, I went to heaven as an evangelical, and you've got this holding place like the Mormons have where you get to decide whether you're going to be in... And he said, you know what? They may be a little confused about their theology, but they're coming back with lives filled with service and with good works and with kind deeds. And then he says, and I quote, if the devil is inspiring such godly work, he's confused about his job description. No, he's not. What part of, watch out, Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. So why are you surprised that his servants come disguised as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, 14, 15. These great theologians who stand up and pontificate on stupidities. He's not confused. What's the most important fruit? It's not the fruit of life. That can vary depending. It's the fruit of doctrine. How do I know? Verse 20, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, which means it's kind of important to know what the will is, right? I don't care what you're experiencing. What are you teaching? What is your doctrine? First Timothy 6, 3 through 5, if anyone advocates a different doctrine that doesn't agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine conforming to godliness, he's conceited and understands nothing. He who knows God listens to us. 
He who is not from God does not listen to us, 1 John 3, 8. What is the teacher, healer, prophet at all teaching about the fundamentals of the faith, about the Bible, about God, about Jesus Christ, about the virgin birth, the resurrection, the exclusivity of Jesus, or are there many paths to God? About the Trinity, T.D. Jakes is a modalist. He believes, like William Branham did, that the Trinity is a doctrine out of the pit of hell. See Peter Wagner, one of the great founding, guiding lights of the New Apostolic Reformation, thinks that the Trinity is a non-essential. Excuse me? What? Hell, Rob Bell and Brian McLaren, you already know that. But Rick Warren, when you're talking about what are the fundamentals of the faith, he said, hey, today there aren't really many that fundamentalists left. I don't know if you know it or not, there's such a minority. There aren't that many fundamentalists left in America. And then he, he tells you he knows what the word fundamentalist means. He says, now the word fundamentalist actually comes from a document in the 1920s called the Five Fundamentals of the Faith. It's a legalistic, narrow view of Christianity. Oh, really? I wonder which of the fundamentals he would think we need to get rid of because it's such a legalistic, narrow view. Maybe the first fundamental of literal Inerrancy of the autographs, the original edition of the scriptures that were, that were inspired and God breathed by the Holy Spirit. Is that one of the fundamentals we can do what? without? What about the virgin birth and the deity of Christ? What about the substitutionary view of the atonement, that he died on the cross to take the penalty for your sin and mine upon himself, so that as we believe in him, you may come into the presence of the Father, covered in his righteousness and not yours? What about the bodily resurrection of Christ? Is that a fundamental that we can just as well do without? What about the imminent return of Christ? What fundamentals does he think we can dispense with? I will tell you, it is a frightening thing to see the big teachers of Christianity bring in doctrines of demons that people buy. Ironside, Dr. Harry Ironside said, look, Error is like leaven, of which we read a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, Galatians 5, 9. Truth mixed with error is equivalent to all error, except it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. God hates such a mixture. And I wish we had time to talk about the word and about poor Paul instructing even poorer Timothy not to teach, to, uh, teach uh, certain men, not to teach strange doctrines. And I will tell you, as you know, that is dangerous work today liable to get yourself labeled a hater, a Pharisee, a divider of truth, and already Romans chapter 16 was mentioned. Those of us who are pointing these things out are not the ones who are the dividers of the brethren. According to Romans 16, verse 17 and 18, Paul said, now I urge you, brethren, keep an eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances contrary to the teachings you've learned and stay away from them. These are the ones who by smooth and flattery speech Deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Let's come back now to Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, the doctrine. What do you believe about Jesus? That is the essential point. What are these men teaching you about Jesus Christ of Nazareth? John 6, 28, make a note of it. Lord, what must we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, Jesus himself is saying, what you believe about me is the most important work that you can do for God. God is an advocate. This is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Not that you do a whole bunch of other things, right? Because many will say to me in that day, but Lord, Lord, in your name we cast out demons. In your name we prophesied. In your name we healed and did many miracles. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Was he advocating a gospel of works? You didn't do enough stuff? But Lord, Lord, these people thought they had relationship with Jesus. Clearly, they had relationship with the wrong Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 4, and 5. But I'm afraid for you, little children, lest as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel, 
you dodo birds very beautifully, editorial edition there, but that's basically what he's saying. There is a counterfeit Jesus. There is a counterfeit Holy Spirit that produces genuine signs and wonders and miracles according to Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 23, 24, and 25. Matthew chapter 7, right? But Lord, in your name we prophesied, cast out demons, did many miracles. I never knew you. The most important thing is what are they teaching you about Jesus? 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. Now, as an occultist, I would have said to you, well, uh, duh, I'm cool on this one. I believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh, by which I meant I, what, I could have gone up to him. I could have pinched him. He'd have said, ouch. Of course he came in the flesh. What are you talking about? This verse was addressed and written to the pre-Gnostics, a group of, of heretics that were already rising up. Many of the epistles were written to refute the early heresies that were starting in the church. And he's saying, hey, you've got some people coming into the church that's saying matter is bad, matter is evil, like the Hindus, right? Matter is not good. Jesus Christ couldn't be God in human flesh because flesh is evil. He had to be separate. Jesus was the Christ spirit over here that came upon him during the baptism and left before the crucifixion. And he has not, Jesus Christ has not come as God incarnate in human flesh. And the Holy Spirit was saying through John, think again. But look at what some of the occultists will do with this. There was a spirit that we followed for a long time, uh, channeling through a, a housewife named Penny Torres. Her, his, the name of the spirit was called Mafu. He made so many gaffes. We, some of us in the field started calling him Snafu. And Mafu... When he was confronted, I've got a CD of it, where a young Christian came into one of the sessions and Mafu claimed to be a 32,000 year old along with Ramtha, the spirit who was coming to pronounce great wisdom and pontificate upon the ills of man and how to resolve them. And this young Christian, you could hear them gathering up their courage and they quoted this first, do you, be do you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? And listen to what Mafu, this demon spirit channeling through this little housewife said, what is called Jesus entity is a remarkable master who gave great love and lifted the whole of mankind. I would never deny that what is called Jesus is Lord God because he is. And you could hear the girl go, oh, what do I do now? But here comes the kicker. But so are you, dear lady. Yes, of course, Jesus is Lord God incarnate in human flesh, and so are you. Like Shirley MacLaine, I am God, I am God, and you are God, and the lectern is God, and the podium is God, and, 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 and Rick Warren is God, and even Pastor Gary's God. We're all God. When everything is God, nothing is God. Damned by faint praise and twisted. I'll tell you, today in today's society, the name of Jesus has become kind of like that of, of Lord Voldemort. You must not be named. You don't dare speak his name in public. Akiana, how many of you watched the movie Heaven is for Real, this, this little movie that's coming out that so many Christians are thinking, oh, Heaven is for Real, a four-year-old child told us, and what's not to like about this beautiful little boy and his pastor father? But you remember how he started out? The little boy with Akiana, this child prodigy who began painting these wonderful pictures and she painted a, a portrait of Jesus because she claimed from the time she was three or four years old, she was taken up into heaven. And Thomas Nelson published her book because gee golly, she was talking about Jesus and Mary and heaven and these experiences. And she painted this beautiful portrait of Jesus called the Prince of Peace. And this has to be from God. But I saw an interview that she did. I read one in 2009 in Ventura Country Star, July 14th. And the interviewer said this, although some of her most well-known paintings depict Jesus and Mary, Akiana is not wedded to Christianity. Listen to what this child, who is touted as a great Christian mystic, who has seen visions of Jesus, actually believes about Jesus. And you tell me if this is the same one of scripture. Quote, 
I don't really belong to any religion, she said. We used to go to all different kinds of churches. Now we have a home church. It's more like a conversation. She must have joined an emergent church. They don't have sermons, they have conversations where everybody sits around and pulls their collective ignorance on the subject of whatever they pick out of their Bible and conclude about what they feel about it because nobody can know the truth. So much, these things I have written, what we have seen, what we have handled, what we have touched, this we declare to you that our joy may be made full, that you may know who Jesus Christ is. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things he's revealed belong to us. And one of the things he wants you to know is who he is and who the living son of God is. But she says, we have conversations about religion, love and unity. The easiest way to say it is, I belong to God. I accept all faiths. Quote, my mind has grown up. When I was younger, I really only saw one road. I only had one subject, Jesus, Mary, heaven. Now I see so many roads I have to explore. Different cultures, background, religions. I'm going inside people's minds, seeing different dimensions. And I just painted a Hindu monk. It's so neat to combine everybody's religion. Syncretism, we're going to talk about that in a minute. At age 16, Akiana said this about Jesus. Jesus shared with us, I am the way, the truth, and the light. She said light. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not the light. He is the light. But he said, I am the true life, the bread of life. No one lives without me. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now listen to what she says in the subtle twist. I feel that he invited us to participate in the divinity. He is divine. He's come to show us how to be divine. Like Eric Butterworth and Oprah Winfrey, Jesus Christ came not to tell us how divine he was, but to show us how divine we are. Each one of us is one of kind, literally, she said, original path to the way of truth and light. And without our individual love and effort, we cannot understand and reach God. God isn't something you work your way towards. You cannot work your way to God. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you think you can work your way to God? You've got the, another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. You got the wrong one. Todd Bentley, you remember Todd Bentley of the Lakeland, Florida thing? He had a vision of Jesus in his trailer before one of his performances where he was knocking little old ladies in the teeth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy, bam! And he said Jesus came to him with gold dust and angel feathers and this wonderful feeling and vibration. And Jesus came to him and manifested and said, Son, you need to get the people to believe in the supernatural and in angels. And even Todd Bentley had enough sense to say, Hi, I thought I was supposed to get them to believe in you. And Jesus says to him, listen to this, They already believe in me. But if you can get them to believe in angels and the supernatural, then you'll really see the stuff. Why do you think he was standing there chanting, angels, angels, angels? Though we or an angel from heaven come and preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached, let him be cursed to hell forever. Let him be anathema. You think the apostles were gentle, kind, and meek of language? How's that for politically correct? I I wonder how many pastors get away with that in today's pulpit. Colossians 2.18, let no one keep defrauding you of our prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions he's seen inflated without cause in his fleshly mind, reprobate and lost. William Branham, the patron saint of, of of the New Apostolic Reformation, right? Oh, we call upon Todd Bentley a double portion of the Branham anointing and the Branham mantle to come upon. Okay, who the heck was William Branham? He was a, 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 an evangelist in the 40s. He used to travel with Oral Roberts until they had a major clash of the egos and parted ways, and then they went doing their own apostate stuff on their own, in their own little tents. Here's some of the things that he taught. Jesus was created and not the eternal word. What is God? Why, God is the great eternal at the beginning, way back before there was a beginning. It wasn't even God, don't you know? Did you know that? God's an object of worship, and there weren't nothing to worship him. God wasn't even God until he made humans to worship him, unquote. On the word of God, Branham taught that the word of God was given in three forms, the zodiac, the Egyptian pyramids, and the written scripture. 
oh, the word, yes, we love the word, the word, the word. Yeah, we love the word, but the zodiac's the word, too, and so is the pyramids. On the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine, is, Trinitarianism is of the devil. I tell you that, thus saith the Lord. He believed that he was a God and could decree things like God, that there was no eternal hell right up in there with Rob Bell. Boy, are they in for a sussy. Branham described Patasar Lari Matu Krishna as the son of God as Jesus Christ returned. Oh, a double portion of the Branham anointing. And people are saying, oh, hallelujah, praise God. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Hallelujah. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Somebody mentioned Kenneth Copeland yesterday. yesterday. Kenneth Copeland. In the Believer's Voice of Victory magazine, February 1987 edition, he was standing there so proud in front of his little mountain cabin, and he was saying he had a vision of Jesus, and he said Jesus reported to him, Oh, my son, don't be too upset when people accuse you of thinking you're God. They made the same mistake about me. I never claimed I was God. I only claimed I knew God and walked with him. The more you get to be like me, the more they'll come to wait, think that way of you. I never claimed I was God. I only claimed I knew God and walked with him. Another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. What the goodness is the church thinking, showering mega billions of dollars upon these heretics and blasphemers who deny the word of God. I wish I could tell you about Brian. I've got a stack here of quotes from these false prophets who are still on television, still writing huge books and labeled as great prophets of the Lord. What Jesus are you talking about? Jesus the shaman, the guru, the wise man, the prophet, the psychic, the witch, the first socialist, the spirit brother of Lucifer, the reincarnation of King David, an angel, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah, the Jesus of the Gnostic Gospels who married Mary Magdalene, the Jesus of the homosexual community who believed that he was a raging queen and a homosexual, the Queen James Bible, Try that one on for size sometime. They're following the wrong Jesus. And I will tell you, it is tragic. It is horrifying when the church makes a virtue out of toleration of unscriptural teachings and ideas in the name of love and unity. Yes, God wants unity, but never at the expense of truth. If you've got unity at the expense of truth, you have embraced another Jesus, a different spirit, a different doctrine, a different gospel, and you have embraced doctrines of devils. You have helped the Antichrist and Satan lay the foundation for the one world church that's going to re uh, revere the Antichrist. Point number one is theology. Point number two. Now listen carefully because you're not going to be able to write it all down. I got long-winded with this, but get the point of it. If a miracle... A sign, a wonder, a prophecy, a healing is performed by an occultist or by means of an occult technique. Whether it's internal, like clairvoyance, ESP, uh, like the girl with the spirit of divination in Acts 16. I wish we had time to get into that. We probably don't. Whether it's internal or external, like the Ouija boards, the, the crystal ball, the tarot cards, palm reading. It is by definition not of God regardless of how spectacular, holy, or angelic it may, be, it may be appearing. It is a demonic counterfeit, even if Jesus' name is attached to it. In other words, if it's performed by an occultist or someone using occult techniques, it is not from God. It's really not very complicated. Deuteronomy 18, we looked at it last night. We don't have the time to get into the whole thing tonight. Make a note of it. Where God gives the children of Israel, beginning in verse 9, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 and following, when you enter the land the Lord your God gives you, you sh there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through fire, right, which is a form of child sacrifice, anyone who practices divination, anyone who is using uh, uh, spiritism or necromancy or the superstitious or sorcery. All He covers the full gamut of occultism, and he says it's abomination before him. Verse 12. For whoever does these things is abominable, detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for those nations which you shall dispossess. Listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, children of God, the Lord your God is not allowed to, you to do so. You ever wonder why the, the land of, of Cana was open to the children of God. Why did God destroy the Canaanites? It's because they were practicing every form of occultism. 
and idolatry. And God said it's abomination. And by the way, he held the nations accountable as he did Sodom and Gomorrah. Not just the children of Israel were held accountable because of their idolatry. He brought judgment on Babylon, Isaiah chapter 47. He brought judgment on the Assyrians. He brought judgment on Nineveh. He brought judgment on the people of the world. He flooded them out. The whole thing was a wash. I mean, it was a real mess there. He destroyed the Canaanites for it because they were involved in this. He repeatedly judged his people for it. But Leonard Sweet, you've heard about Leonard Sweet a few times in quantum spirituality. I mean, this man makes me crazy. I got tired of hauling his 500-page dingbad books around, so I yanked the pages out, and I carry them with me. Let me give you a tiny, super quick sample of some of the things that this heretic who was almost invited to one of your sister churches just down the road, right? He says on page 233 of Quantum Spirituality, written in 1991, but for the most part, Christians keep in good repair the, listen to the language, prejudices against what may be God's other sign languages of the fourth dimension also known as the fourth psychology. Listen to this, transpersonal, transhuman, transcendent states of consciousness include most predominantly extrasensory perception, the mind's ability to acquire, in other words, he's covering every single form of occultism. We don't have time to get into all this gobbledygook, psychobabble language of pseudo-scientific mushmash. Altered states of consciousness, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, ESP, retrocognition, telepathy. He says, yet the church, fearing the stamp of lunacy, remains antagonistic or indifferent to even broaching a subject about which everyone seems to know something. Yeah, we know something about it, and those who take the Bible seriously know that the something we know about it is God told us all about it, and he said it's abomination. Keep your cotton-picking mittens out of it. In fact, the percentage of Americans, he said, who express confidence in paranormal experience is steadily climbing. And then he gives us statistics, which are horrifying. We saw some of that yesterday, where he promotes and talks about people like David Spangler, one of the key New Agers that you've seen referred to several times. David Spangler, the same David Spangler who talked about the importance of taking a Luciferic initiation to enter the New Age. And Leonard Sweet is promoting him and bragging him, where he's promoting techniques of occultism about hold your Bible and breathe meditatively. The breathing, nay, breath-giving truth of aliveness is more than Methuselian and its fan. Aren't you impressed with how wise and smart he is? Isn't he intelligent? I am um, he, a member of Mensa, I'm sure. <laughs> part of your body right now is actually literally part of the body of Abraham, Sarah, Noah, Esther, David, Abigail, Moses, Ruth, Matthew, Mary, Luke, Martha, John, Priscilla, Paul, and Jesus. Don't you know you have atoms in you that once belonged to Jesus? Because clearly he wasn't resurrected from the dead. He disintegrated somewhere and you now have absorbed his molecules in some quantum mishmash. Keep breathing quietly, he said, while holding, while holding your Bible. Yeah, that's going to keep the devil at bay. Don't you know the sword of the spirit? That'll do it. What, the devil's a cockroach? You have within you not just the powers of goodness resident in the great spiritual leaders like Moses, Jesus, Mo Jesus didn't even qualify as first. Moses, then Jesus, then Muhammad, Lao Tzu. You also have within you the forces of evil and destruction. We could go on and on and on and on. It is horrifying. Tilden Edwards. Ray Young, and you guys had better not leave this place unless you promise that you're going to go and order his books. Make him take your name and sign up and, or, and go to Lighthouse Trails and you order his material. And Warren Smith's and Carol's. You'll get the documentation you need for this. He quotes in his wonderful book, A Time of Departing, Tilden Edwards, the founder of the Shalem Institute in Washington. Listen to what Tilden Edwards said. In the wider ecumenism of the spirit being opened for us today, God is no longer as narrow-minded and bigoted as he used to be when these idiots wrote the New Testament. Loose translation, we need to humbly accept the learnings of particular Eastern religions. What makes a particular practice Christian isn't its source, but its intent. This is important in the face of those Christians. Ah, oh, that would be me.
who would try to impoverish our spiritual resources by too narrowly defining them. Selective attention to Eastern spiritual practices can be of great assistance to a fully embodied Christian life. In other words, you idiots can't possibly expect to find everything you need for life and holiness in this. The Holy Spirit isn't going to give you what you need. You need to adopt the practices of the mystics and occultists. Never mind that Isaiah chapter 2 verse 6 says, For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they're filled with influences from the east. And they're soothsayers like the Philistines. Why did God bring judgment continually on his people? You see it at the very beginning in Exodus 32. Syncretism, the, the loose smushing together of the, of the religions, philosophies, beliefs, and practices of the pagans and the world with Christianity, with, with the worship of the true God. And God hates it. You remember in Exodus 32, Moses was taking a bit of his time going up in the mountain, getting the Ten Commandments, took a little longer than expected, and left Aaron behind, the consummate people's pastor. He was a true pastor and in touch with the felt needs of the people. He knew what they needed, and they said, well, what is with your brother? He's up in the mountain, and we need... Fine, we will be, build us a God. We need some tangible. We've been in Egypt 400 years. Ipus bull, we understand. Bulls we get. Make us a bull. And so Aaron said, well, all right, okay. I need the felt needs of the people. And so he gathers this gold stuff and he, and he put, makes the gold calf and he puts it together. And when, when God says to Moses, get thee down from the mountain for my people have corrupted themselves. And Moses comes down and Moses was so impressed he said, wow, this is so cool. Look how creative you guys got. You now have, have, have added what was impoverished in your relationship with the living God. I mean, yeah, the 10 miracles in Egypt, but what's he done for you lately? <laughs> and you got to love Aaron. Boy, he'd have done well in the average pulpit today. What a sense of humor. Well, the people pressed on me, and, and so I gathered the gold, and I threw it in the pot, and... Out came this calf. <laughs> huh? Isn't that kind of like what we're saying now? Well, I gathered all these, these, and out came contemplative prayer. And voices in my head that claim to be God, and I dare not question because Lou Giglio and John Wimber told me not to. Oh, people of God, wake up. God loathes syncretism. Deuteronomy 12. Verse 29 through 32, we'll look at this one briefly. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, don't you even think you're going to look at how these people worship their gods and think that you are going to follow me that way. Verse 31, well, let me take it up to 29. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you're going to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, beware that you are not ensnared to follow after them after they're destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods, that I may also do likewise? Tilda Edwards, are you listening out there? Leonard Sweet isn't. He's too busy leading worship seminars at some of our churches. You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God. For every abominable act which the Lord hates, they've done for their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Oh, but, but, but this is real stuff. Really? God loathes it. But I will tell you, even the wisest man on the face of God's earth, King Solomon, fell into syncretism. One of the most tragic passages in scripture is 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 through 10. And Solomon gathered for himself many wives in direct violation to God's command. And he built altars. You, I've been to Israel. You, you can see the remnant of three altars that he built facing away from Jerusalem for his heathen wives. And it was 300 years before those things were destroyed. Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, 1 through 3, offered strange fire before the Lord God. A sloppy way, oh, God doesn't care, we'll just put this together, never mind that he gave us, seeing as, you know, one of, the, one of the perks of uncreated divinity is you get to make some of the rules. Oh, God will be pleased if I bring my, my first fruits to him. Oh, really, Cain, think again. God gets to tell us what is pleasing to him. The creature is not the same 
as the creator. The pot is not the same as the potter, for it to think it's the same as the potter is to make it a crackpot. <laughs> God gets to tell us what he expects of us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus said to us, for in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, do not give like the hypocrites, and he tells us what they're like. Do not pray like the hypocrites, he tells us what that's like. And by the way, while you're at it, don't pray like the pagans either, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not pray like the heathen, the meaningless, you've heard the whole thing this, this weekend. The meaningless repetitions, the mantras, the rosary beads, the centering prayer, Lectio Divina, contemplative prayer, soaking prayer, breath prayers, labyrinths, guided imagery visualization, ad nauseum conjuring Jesus or power animals, the automatic writing of Sarah Young who heard a voice in her head and assumed it was Jesus because it never dawned on her there was another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. And hear my heart, people, hear the heart of those who've spoken to you this weekend. We mentioned these people not because we didn't like the colored dress they were wearing yesterday or because we took exception with the tone of their voice on any given afternoon or we cherry-picked one itty-bitty little... Look, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is at stake, the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 had the temerity to confront Peter and Barnabas to their face, calling them hypocrites twice. Oh, don't touch God's anointing. If anyone could have said, thou shalt not touch God's anointing, it would have been Peter and Barnabas when the apostle Paul came to them and said, you hypocrites, you're hobnobbing with the Judaizers and you're compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul and Peter uh, and Barnabas all wound up good friends. How do I know? Because in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Peter says, long after Galatians 2, where he was confronted, and our beloved brother Paul, some of whose teachings are a little hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort as they do the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. A man of true humility before the living God accepts the word of rebuke, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Yeah, that's going to fly in your average pulpit today. That pastor will be out on his keister so fast it'll make everybody's head spin. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Why? Because a time will come when they will not endure sound. Ooh, what's the word? Doctrine. You say the word doctrine today and, and it's kind of whispered and you get a picture of a kitty cat coming out of a litter box. <laughs> doctrine. Read Titus, read First and Second Timothy. Preach sound doctrine. Poor Timothy. What he was entrusted with and what you and I are entrusted with. Because let me tell you, oh, well, we didn't know about it. You do now. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Christian yoga, Christian Buddhism, Christian Wiccans. I periodically get messages on Facebook from Wiccans who start, you look just at the service, oh, I'm devoted and I love Jesus Christ. Okay, well, that's totally cool. And I always go on their pay, like page. Oh, I like witches' voice. I like the pagan federation. I like the witches this and the occult that and the green whatever and the psychic thing. And I'm thinking, gotcha. God says you cannot mush together biblical Christianity and demonic teachings. Their name is legion, the slain in the spirit, the shrieking, the howling, the barking, the uncontrollable laughter, so-called holy laughter, which is neither holy nor funny. The jerking uncontrollably, oh, I can't help it, I can't help it. Really? Last time I read the scripture, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Cut it out in the name of Jesus. Oh. Mike Batterson's The Circle Maker, using occult techniques, draws a circle around you based on some fable out of, out, of, out of Judaism. The witches love to draw circles around everything and claim it and speak it into existence and raise their cones of power. These things are not from the Lord. They have their roots in ancient occultism. And do you really think it's God you're honoring and experiencing by using techniques he's condemned? But I will tell you, I came across years ago I was given this by a researcher who found it, left accidentally behind in a postal instant press. It was being, uh, the gal realized she left it, she came running back in, but meanwhile my friend saw it, said, oh, 
I got to make a copy of this for Johanna. And it was a newsletter. Greetings, brothers and sisters in witchcraft, from the desk of Diana, October 12, 1983. This is a copy of what she gave me. Remember our summer youth programs, each one reach one, blah, blah, blah. During the installation, we had among the group two Christians, and guess what? One, two, three, four exclamation points. They are now first stage initiates. So you know, now is the time for all good witches to come out of the closet and share the good news with all your friends, neighbors, and, and fellow workers. We have four ministers in this area who belong to our group. St. Gabriel Union Church, Rosemead Foursquare, Rosemead Lutheran, and Rosemead Baptist. If you churches are listening, I'm fervently hoping that those pastors from 1983 aren't still there. If they are, you need to know the history of what was going on in your church back then. Because according to these witches, their pastors were first level initiates in witchcraft. And listen to what they said. So we're pretty well covered and are gathering converts from these groups. Attention, when attending these churches, look like the members and drive by on some Sunday and take a good look at them, see how they dress, and please notice they all carry Bibles and have sickly smiles. Oh, and don't forget to say praise the Lord frequently. Do not wear any of your ritual jewelry out there. They're on the lookout for such things, blah, 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 blah. Do you get the point, people? Do you think... We aren't being invaded now by spirits of devils working miracles. And I will tell you, the church today more closely resembles the nightmare scenario in Ezekiel chapter 8 than it does the holy bride of the living God. Remember in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel was having supper one afternoon with the 70 elders from, from the temple. And all of a sudden, the spirit of God takes them, whether in the body or out of the body, but he takes them and he gives them a vision of the temple in Jerusalem. Read that passage. And he looks through a little chink and he sees the courtyard filled with these elders who are worshiping the, the, the foreign demon gods. And he goes a little further and he sees the women weeping for Tammuz, the Babylonian fertility god. And he goes into the Holy of Holies and he sees the elders with their butts up in the air, facing away from the altar, worshiping the sun. Every one of the priests, every one of the leaders, every one of the elders. And I will tell you the church of Jesus Christ is more like that. Oh, Johanna, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Good Lord, people, have you guys taken a close look at the eyes of that baby you've clasped to your bosom? This is Rosemary's baby we're talking about. What's it doing in your tub? Eat the meat, spit out the bones. It's the back end of a Komodo dragon. How much of that do you want to feed your babies? Point number three. Number one was theology. Number two was if it's done by an occultist, it's not from the Lord. And if it's syncretism, it's in the same category. Number three, the prophecies and teachings of the prophets must be 100% accurate 100% of the time. And they have to square 100% with the Bible if their source is God. Deuteronomy 18.21 through 22, you may say in your heart, how do we know? The word which the Lord has not spoken, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that's the thing the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. And I will tell you, I wish we had the time, I will not make it because I know we're almost out of time. Bob Jones, these guys are so kind to one another, claims that, quote, he was told the general level of prophetic revelation in the church was about 65% accurate at this time. Oh, we're just learning our prophetic gift. So we're 65% accurate. Some are only 10% uh, accurate. A very few of the most mature prophets are approaching 85 or 95% accuracy. Prophecy is increasing in purity, but there's still a long way to go for those who walk in this ministry. This is actually grace for the church now. Listen to this. Because 100% accuracy in this ministry will bring a level of accountability to the church, which she's too immature to bear at this time. It would result in too many Ananias and Sapphiras, you think? <laughs> Steve Schultz of Elijah List says, quote, No prophet I've known has ever gotten every prophecy 100% right. Prophets and prophetic people grow into their gift, just as pastors, teachers, and evangelists do. Right, I remember Isaiah saying that. Oh, 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 never mind about that prophecy. Wasn't really right on that one, but this one's okay. Rick Joyner says the same thing. We're not going to take the time for it. Remember 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, Micaiah, Ahab, and Jehoshaphat? 
Micaiah was a true prophet of the Lord. And you remember King Ahab running around there with Jezebel and Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, but dumb as a stick, and he let his son marry. All right, so they're going to go to war against Ramoth Gilead. Okay, let's go to war. Yeah, okay, says Jehoshaphat, but I want to inquire of the Lord. Well, I got all these 400 prophets. Yeah, the ones that were left over that didn't get slaughtered by Elijah in the, in the showdown on Mount Carmel, right? When he slaughtered the pro false prophets of Baal, and there were 400 of Ashtari left. Fine. Oh, go and conquer, O oh king. You will do hunky dory again. Well, yeah, but isn't there a prophet of the real Lord around? Well, there's one, but I hate his guts because he never says anything nice about me. Well, bring him anyway. Okay, so here they haul in poor Micaiah. And Micaiah says, Oh, go and conquer. Haven't I told you, speak truth to me in the name of the Lord, says that colossal, ball faced hypocrite Ahab. Very well, you want the truth, O oh king. I see the people of the Lord and they're like sheep without a shepherd scattered across the land. And I see the Lord sitting in his throne and he's surrounded by spirits. And he said, who will be a stumbling block and cause King Ahab to fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spirit said this and another spirit said that. And then one spirit came up and said, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets and will cause him to stumble. And the Lord said, go and prosper and bring destruction. And that is exactly what happened. People, it happens in the church today. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 through 11. We've looked at this passage before. Make a note of it. Speaking of the Antichrist, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send a deluding influence upon them that they may believe what is false, because they did not have a love for the truth to his, so as to be saved. I beg you in the name of the Lord, do not be as the arrogant ones who hand back a book bringing clarity and bringing perhaps a new understanding like another Jesus calling to the head pastors of some of the biggest ministries in this area. And the first reaction is to throw the book. Oh, we don't need this thing. We got lots of junk like this coming through. There is no love of the truth so as to be saved. And then they're shocked that they fall into deception. I do not have time to go into the false prophecies because we're about wrapping up now. Benny Hinn, let me just give you one. The spirit tells me Fidel Castro will die in the 1990s. The spirit of God tells me an earthquake will hit the east coast of America and destroy much in the 90s. The Lord says in the mid-90s, about 94 or 95, the homosexual community will be destroyed. And he won't destroy it in the, in the way many think he will. He'll destroy it with fire. He, the living God, is the one who causes the omens of boasters to fail. And he makes fools out of diviners, Isaiah 44, 25. And I wish we had the time. Make a note of Ezekiel 13, 1 through 10. There are, read Ezekiel, read Jeremiah, read Isaiah. They prophesy from their own inspiration, following their own spirit. They've seen nothing. They see falsehood and lying divination who are saying the Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope for the fulfillment of the word. These prophets in Jeremiah 23, I had a dream, I had a dream. Yeah, goody, so what? Let the prophet who has a dream share his dream. But let the one who has my word share my word with the people. What is straw in common with grain? You had a dream, goody for you. God uses dreams, mind you, make no mistake. You have people in this place, I know, who have had true dreams from the Lord. But be careful. The prophet who has his dream may relate it, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What a strong common with grain. Look, what is the purpose of a true prophet? Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow you're going to marry me. Yeah, but I'm already married and I got 18 children. Yeah, but God told me. Is that the purpose of prophecy? The purpose of true prophecy, read 1 Corinthians 12, read 1 Corinthians 14, read about the gifts of the Spirit in Romans and Ephesians. The purpose of a true prophet, even in the Old Testament, under the office of prophet, not just the gift of prophet, is to call the people to repentance, to speak God's word. What is the purpose of a prophet? Is in order that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, that he says to the paralytic, rise up, take up your pallet and go home. It wasn't just to speak a word or to do a miracle or to speak. Oh, but the word came true, really goody. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, Deuteronomy 13 verse one, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder and it comes true, 
concerning what he says, let us follow after other gods whom you've not known. You shall not listen to that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to see if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But as for that prophet or that dreamer of dreams who counseled rebellion to follow after another Jesus, a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit gospel, that prophet comes under condemnation and in the Old Testament was executed. Jeremiah 23, 21, and 22. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Jeremiah 5, verse 30 and 31, an appalling and a horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule in their own authority and my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? The last test, and we will finish with this, Pastor, is the inner witness. See, as uh, H. Spurgeon said, look, discernment isn't knowing the difference between wrong and right. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. John 7:17. 7, if any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it's of God or I speak for myself. And I will tell you people, discernment in the church is more desperately needed now than ever before. Those who have their senses trained by the word of God to discern good and evil. You don't need some gift of discernment. Pray for it. But you can tell if you apply and listen to the teachings you have so patiently and faithfully listened to for so many hours this weekend. If you compare those teachings to the word of God, you have in the word the sufficiency of what you need to live in godliness, to walk by faith, to show the fruit of the spirit and to test the words of those who claim to be prophets but are not. Let me close with Philippians chapter one, verse nine through 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Amen.